You're watching Swipe coming up. The science of winning, what it takes to be the best on the rugby pitch. Extreme 360, we meet the climbers using advanced cameras. Serving up controversy, why these guys have come in for criticism. And it's time to plan your escape in this week's Games Review. Hello and welcome to Swipe. This week we're taking a look at the technology making the difference between victory and defeat in rugby. We're here in Guildford where Harlequins Rugby Union team train and where every player's movement is carefully recorded and analysed. So what does it take to create the perfect performance on the pitch? Will Sargent's been finding out. It looks a bit like a remote control or a mobile phone. But the information gathered by this little box could hold the key to success on the rugby pitch. Sports scientist. The GPS tracker sits in a small pocket at the back of the shirt and together with a heart rate monitor allows the team of analysts to record every move the players make. This year we've got a system with Deloitte that has pretty much everything going into it. So all of our heart rate measures, any monitoring measures, the wellness questionnaires the boys fill out, RPEs of sessions, the GPS data, uh, the physiotherapy data, everything kind of gets pulled into one place which allows us to kind of analyse and look for trends and try and best manage the squad and best manage the load. But GPS isn't the only tool available to the team. Another analyst positions himself on a nearby rooftop to film the session. And above the players' heads, a drone keeps tabs on training. The footage captured by the cameras is then fed into a computer and analysed in detail. For the coaches, this technology is vital to understanding the stresses on the players. Certainly I think all clubs uh, are right, you know, at the cutting edge of, what, of how you interpret data and that's the biggest thing for us is uh, it's not just having reams and reams of data, it's actually sifting through it all and having the people here who will actually be able to provide us with the data that matters uh, and that's a huge part of what we do. Just like any Premiership team, competition for starting places at Harlequins is tough and many of the players work with the analysts to improve their game and prepare for matches. It's great to get, get an overhead view, you can see running lines, you can see how things go and then we get it sent a copy of training so when you get home you're able to then log in, have a look through the video and, uh, and, and see how you're doing because it's one thing feeling it when you're on the pitch you might not necessarily be able to see everything around you when it's on a, on a, on a video clip you can then go, oh this guy was here, maybe I should have made a different decision. Winning a rugby match is ultimately down to who scores the most points on the pitch but the careful analysis of data could give you a head start well before you even kick off. Will Sargent, Sky News. Well, I'm joined now by Kevin Gill, the senior performance analyst here at Harlequins. Kevin, some of that tech we saw in Will's piece there is, is truly fascinating. Does all of it make your job easier or does any of it add an extra layer of pressure? So a lot of the tech is about making our job easier. That's why we've got it. Um, but some of it, obviously, new technology We've got to learn how to use it. So in terms of the drone, learn how to fly it, learn the kind of footage we're going to get and then how to get that into a format. Is that, that quite complicated? It can be quite complicated, yeah, and to get it into a format that works for all our coaches and all our players. So there's a slight difficulty with that, but essentially, yeah, it's about looking at new technology and trying to stay, to stay ahead of the game. Do all the other clubs also have a similar amount and level of technology? Uh, well, not quite. I mean... As a department, we're constantly evolving, so we're trying to keep our finger on the pulse and stay ahead of the game. So each club is, is doing the same. So as, as I say, it's a bit of a cliche. If we're not moving forward, we're moving backwards. So hopefully, if we're looking at new technology, new things are out there, we're trying to stay ahead of the other clubs. And what about across sport in general? Where does rugby rank in terms of how advanced their technology is? Yeah, but right up there. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually part of the English Institute of Sport, um, which is the leading provider of sports science tra practitioners across the UK. So I've seen British cycling, I've seen canoe slalom and uh, lots of different sports. So it's great for us to be able to tap into that and bring that into rugby. But yeah, my opinion is that rugby is right up there in terms of uh, the technology we use. So you mentioned cycling there. Has rugby been influenced by the kind of technology you see in cycling? Well, bits and pieces that I've learned from cycling I've brought in here um, and then back the other way as well. Things that they did here before I, before I came here have, have transferred back to British cycling as well. It's so right it's, up there. What about football? Where would football rank? I'd say football, 
I was at Liverpool Football Club a while ago at the academy, um, and I'd say that rugby's ahead of the game in terms, really? of, yeah, in terms of the analysis we use. Yeah. All right, well, Kevin Gill, thanks for joining us. Good Thank to you. talk to you. And now for something different. We've all seen pictures of climbers scaling mountains. They make it look so easy. That's probably because it's hard for us to fully understand how hard their task is. Well, now one team has come up with some specially advanced cameras to get us that bit closer to the action. Danny Vachenovic reports. For those with a fear of heights, here's a chance to see the world from a mountain climber's perspective without danger or risk to life. Along with their normal kit, extreme climbers Stefan Segrist and reigning speed record holder Daniel Arnold carried specially developed photography gear as they tackled the north face of the Eiger mountain in the Swiss Alps. In their packs, a box containing six cameras, a rig which could shoot full circle, rechargeable batteries, a GPS unit and telescopic arm, the equipment designed not to hinder. For this project we recorded 360 degree stills and videos with multiple cameras and after that in post-processing these images are then stitched together into a seamless 360 image. The end result, images that effectively act like Google Street View, capturing a range of angles to give the online viewer an interactive experience. The video too is quite spectacular. The climbers pleased they can now share what they see with the rest of the world. The mountain is, uh, I find it very aesthetic. It's a big face. It has different difficulties in ice and drops. Definitely a nice, a very nice climb um, and some great adventure you can have. They may be used to the scenery, but even the climbers were amazed by the results. Wow. It's hoped this venture will inspire others to consider the extreme sport or at the very least appreciate the effort involved. Danny Vichanovic, Sky News. You're watching Swipe. Coming up, we take control of an unusual snake in our games review. But first, here's a roundup of anything you might have missed this week. Microsoft's former chief executive Steve Ballmer is stepping down from the firm's board. He's been with the software giant for 34 years and says he wants to devote more time to the Los Angeles Clippers basketball team, which he recently bought. But he won't be selling his Microsoft stock. It's worth around £9 billion. Having a robot butler sounds pretty good, but a U.S. hotel chain has been criticised for trying to introduce them. Starwood wants to install the droids in 100 hotels across the world, but the U.K. Hotel Workers' Union says they're no replacement for top-quality customer service. The machines are designed to deliver things like toothbrushes and towels to guests' rooms. The late actor Robin Williams could have a character named after him in the next Legend of Zelda game. More than 100,000 people have signed a petition calling for Nintendo to honour the comedian who appeared in many of their adverts. Williams even named his daughter Zelda after the game. The star was found dead last week at his home near San Francisco after committing suicide. An app created by the actor Tom Hanks that lets you type on an iPad, a bit like a typewriter, has gone to the top of the iTunes chart. Hanks Writer looks old-fashioned, but unlike its ink-filled forefather, it can send emails and share documents. The captain, Philip Starr, said the app was inspired by his personal collection of antique typewriters. Eight out of ten 18-year-olds think it's too easy for young people to see pornography online. According to a survey for the Institute for Public Policy Research, viewing pornography becomes typical as early as 13. 46% of those surveyed said sending sexual or naked photos or videos is part of everyday life for teenagers. A new watch for children that uses GPS to help their parents keep track of them is coming to the UK in December. If the child gets lost, they press a panic button on the Hero watch and their location is sent to a family member's phone. It also lets parents create virtual boundaries and sends them a notification if their child leaves that area. The British video games industry was given a boost this week as tax relief finally kicked in. The perk will only apply to companies making what the Treasury calls culturally British games. So if the game is made in the UK and it's providing British jobs, the developer should qualify. Around 500 game studios are based in the UK, employing around 9,000 people. 
Now, you might have to get a little bit imaginative for this week's games review. We've got battles with aliens and playing God in your own fantasy world. They're all a little bit quirky. Here's Holly Nielsen to explain more. Anyone can be a god, so long as someone believes in them. Goddess is Peter Molney's first steps into a scenery-changing mobile game. It's also free to play, which is new for him as well. It's an interesting concept. You take the role of God and you nurture the civilization, not just by creating buildings, but also by shaping the land around you. It's a fabulous idea. Sometimes the controls for shaping the world can be a bit fiddly and not really work on the touch screen. Um, the AI also has a bit of an issue. The villagers tend to wander around in very odd ways, which doesn't really help. It does have a great aspect where if you sail to another island, it involves a kind of a puzzle element to shaping the land, kind of getting your villagers from one place to another. It's not a game that you can sit and play for hours. It's very much a dip in and out of kind of game. But if, if you treat it as that, it does open up very slowly, but it does become a satisfying play. Someone is about to steal the Kingdom Stone and I have to stop them. Freedom Planet is a real love letter to the old 16-bit Sega games. Everything from the humoid animals to the fast-paced platforming, even the way the characters die is all in homage to the old 2D Sonic the Hedgehog games. It has a massive replayability factor with the fact you can play through the modes in three different characters. There's a classic mode, an adventure mode, time trials and collectibles. One thing that is different from Sonic the Hedgehog is the way that you destroy the enemies. In Sonic the Hedgehog, you know, you jump on them and it keeps the pace moving, while in this you have a deliberate attack. Let's it slows the pacing down a little bit, however I think it works because it makes you explore and look around at the world that they've created. As well as having incredibly fun gameplay, I think what they've done with the 16-bit graphics is really inventive. It hasn't just recreated the old Sega games, but it's actually turned them into what you wanted them to be as a child. They've created a much more detailed world, and I think it just looks fantastic. Did you come from another planet or something? In Hohokam you play as a long snake that glides through the air and your task is go through the 17 different areas and find a way of freeing your other snake friends. It's a bit of a confusing game, but it looks absolutely incredible. The gorgeous kind of psychedelic colours with the alien-like flora and fauna. The way that you interact with the environment is incredibly creative. As always with games like this, its strong points are also a little bit of a negative. It can be very confusing because it doesn't have any of the clutter of a usual game. There's no maps, there's no counting, it doesn't tell you what you've done. Although it makes the game look great, it means that you do often find yourself lost in the Warren-like endless areas that there seem to be. However, I do really enjoy the fact that it doesn't take you through a tutorial kicking and screaming and just lets you explore and find the world in your own way. The Escapist is a sandbox game in which you play as a prisoner and your role is to break out of the prison. Now it's a time management game so you've got to try and find a way of breaking out of the prison while sticking to the strict schedule. You don't want to draw attention to yourself by not turning up for roll call, but you've also got to figure a way out. And it's really clever in the way that there are so many ways you can break out of the prison. You can do a classic great escape, you can dig a hole, or you can disguise yourself as a prison officer or cause a riot and try and sneak out. It's really amazing how much they've managed to fit into this little game. The classic 8-bit graphics look fantastic. Although the controls can be a bit fiddly, it's a little bit difficult to master them. Um, it takes a little bit of time to learn that. As I did, the difference between punching someone and talking to someone is in the space bar, so remember that. <laughs> Despite the fiddly controls, it's very addictive, and I think there's hours of gameplay to be had in this game. Well, that's it for this week, and don't forget you can catch up with all the week's breaking tech stories on Sky News for iPad, our smartphone apps, and skynews.com. I'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.